Hi there. You're in the lab with your mate JJ. <laughs> Today we're going to do a, uh, an old book teardown. I, uh, until recently I was calling them book reviews, um, but now I'm going to call them book teardowns because uh, to me a review kind of implies that you read the whole thing and you're reviewing it, um, which is not really what I do. I just do a teardown, which means I look at the front matter and the back matter and then have a look at detail uh, at the table of contents and just get an idea of you know what's in the book and I don't go through in any detail. I do like to zoom in though, just that one little thing. So if something takes my interest while I'm going through the uh, the uh, table of contents, I'll just pick something and, and have a closer look at that uh, as well. Just a little bit of a random zoom in. So yeah, it's going to be the, the old book teardown and the new book teardown. To qualify as an old book, you have to have been published more than 10 years ago. That's the rule. Anything within the last 10 years, I call it new, uh, which is perhaps a little charitable, but uh, that's that's the rules. So um, the book that I'm picking today is published or was published in 1996. Um, the reason I'm doing it particularly is it came up, some of my friends on IRC uh, commented on this book. Um, so I thought I'd do this video for them and, uh, and everyone else too, of course. So um, the book is uh, The Internet with Windows um, by Glenn Moody, published in 1996. And uh, that means, I guess, Windows 95. That would have been out by then. Uh, Windows 98 wouldn't be out for another two years. So um, this was the very early days of... The internet, I guess, as consumers with Windows were coming online, I was certainly one of those. I, I didn't have um, I didn't have a shell account uh, anywhere. I, I didn't have access to Unix of any description. I certainly didn't run Linux at that point in time. Um, so yeah, I had Windows ninety five back in nineteen ninety six, and a, a lot of the software that gets mentioned in this book, I remember using it uh, back then. So uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. Anyway, uh, this is a book teardown, so we're just going to have a look at front matter, the back matter, and then the table of contents, and that'll be that. So I'll pop you over the bench, and let's have a look at this thing. All right, well, here we are on the bench. Here's my coffee, very important. Okay, um, let's clear up some space here. So, the internet with Windows, Glenn Moody. A little uh, illustration there on the cover. It's got a picture of the earth all panned out. Ah, surfing, a metaphor for surfing the web, of course. There's a satellite, person typing out a keyboard, person using a mouse, more keyboard antics over here. A good old CRT PC with some floppy disks. Look at that. And I, oh, look, and it's a road. That, my friends, is the information superhighway. Wow, and a couple of faces checking it all out. That's a pretty cool little graphic on the front there. All right, let's have a look at, says what I'm, uh, have a look at what it says on the back. Can you read that? I'm not sure if you can. I wonder if I could improve that for you. Let me just have a go here. If we go in, uh, I might, I might be able to just zoom in a little. I wonder if you can read that or not. I don't know. Anyway, I'm going to read it out to you. So, uh, let's go through this. More than 1,000 internet addresses in U Europe, the USA, and Asia. 1,000. <laughs> Over 500 Windows 95 screenshots okay and a full glossary most people know that the internet is a huge network of computers that spans the globe and offers unparalleled information resources which are freely available to everyone but most people also believe that using the internet is impossibly complicated and requires advanced tools and a completely different way of working the internet with windows shows you how a new generation of microsoft windows software mostly free or very low cost lets you access the full power of the internet through easy to use techniques you already know from other windows programs it can be read and used by both windows 95 and windows 3.1 users and the vast bulk of it is applicable to other operating systems as well in particular it will be invaluable for those accessing the internet via CompuServe or the microsoft network this book gives simple to understand explanation of all the basic internet concepts with many practical examples. Provides a comprehensive guide to accessing 99% of the internet's resources with just electronic mail. Gives step-by-step -step instructions on how to set up the internet programs contained in Windows 95 and Windows Plus and how to obtain and set up equivalent software for Windows 3.1, which can also be used with Windows 95. Explains how to obtain and configure most of the hundred or so Windows internet shareware programs that are currently available with detailed tips for using them. These include software for all the main tools, email, Usenet, FTP, Telnet, Archie, Gopher, WAIS, and the World Wide Web, 
www. As well as more unusual ones such as ping, trace route, finger, host lookup, X500, who is, PH, chat, IRC, internet programs that use virtual reality, and others that enable you to carry on international conversations for the price of a local call. Give simple instructions on how to set up the learning, the leading www programs, Netscape and Mosaic, both free and include step-by-step -step details on how to write your own web homepage using just a text editor. Tells you how to find things and people on the internet with explicit information about search tools and practical examples. Contains over 1,000 interesting internet addresses to visit, organized in a natural and easy to find way, complete with a unique index. Examines the far-reaching implications of the internet for every computer user, business and organization and its broader impact on society today and tomorrow. This book assumes no previous expertise apart from some basic familiarity with Windows programs. Because the emphasis is on software that shields users from the technique, technicalities of the subject, very little in the way of new skills needs to be learned. Successive chapters build to form a complete introduction to all aspects of using the internet, including elements generally omitted from other books. Glenn Moody has been writing about computers and communications for 15 years. His highly popular Getting Wired page about the internet appears every Thursday in Computer Weekly, and he also writes for The Guardian, The Daily Telegraph, and, Telegraph, and Specialist Titles. Published by Butterworth Heinemann. There you go. So let's, uh, let's go to the front of this thing. Uh, give you a wider view there. Okay. So, let's have a look inside. The internet with Windows. My copy actually, if you have a look there, can you see it's a, um, it's a little bit damaged. There's a little bit of water damage or something. It's a bit mouldy, a bit wet. It's not wet anymore, but it has been wet. Oh. So, this is dedicated to Gawain. Okay. So, all rights reserved, fair enough. And here we are, the contents. We'll have a look at the preface as well. And, uh, There is, I wasn't paying attention, and it was on the last page. Okay, 28 chapters, 28 chapters, five appendices, a glossary, a URL index, and an index. All right, so let's have a look at the table of contents. Chapter one, the internet. Benefits of using the internet. Electronic mail. Usenet, the world's electronic notice board. I think it's fun that it's electronic mail. Back in 1996, it was the electronic mail. Then it became capital E dash capital M A I L. Then it became E dash M A I L. And then it became email. So this is back right at the beginning, isn't it? Electronic mail, Usenet, the world's <coughs> electronic notice board, retrieving files with FTP, controlling computers half the globe away with Telnet, finding things with Archie, Gopher, Veronica, and WAIS, the World Wide Web. Chapter two, how to join the internet, the personal computer, modems, internet providers, Full internet connection. Connection via a host. Costs. Internet software. Chapter 3. Internet basics. Email. Mailing lists. Usenet. FTP. Telnet. Archie. Gopher. WAIS. World Wide Web. Uniform Resource Locator. URL. Chapter 4. Email. Introduction. Sending email. Receiving email. Other mail systems. Headers and signatures. Encoding. Security, netiquette, what to do if things go wrong, other email services. Chapter 5, mailing lists, listserv, other mailing lists, netiquette, what to do if things go wrong. Chapter 6, Usenet, introduction, the structure of new Usenet postings, where to start, encoded postings, accessing Usenet, Usenet by email and other methods, lists of Usenet facts and newsgroups, netiquette, Usenet folklore, what to do if things go wrong. Chapter 7, FTP. FTP by email, file formats, text files, images, sounds, viruses, netiquette, downloading, uploading, what to do if things go wrong, the future of FTP. What do you suppose the future of FTP is? <laughs> All right. Um, telnet, chapter 8, Telnet. Ports, high Telnet, netiquette, what to do if things go wrong. Chapter 9, Archie, netiquette, what to do if things go wrong. Chapter 10, Gopher. Accessing Gopher servers. Accessing Gopher via the World Wide Web, Telnet, and email. Veronica. Jughead. Netiquette. What to do if things go wrong. Chapter 11. Wide Area Information Servers. Introduction. Netiquette. What to do if things go wrong. Chapter 12. World Wide Web. Introduction. A accessing the World Wide Web by Telnet and email. Netiquette. What to do if things go wrong. More information. I think um, that we're going to do our random zoom in. 
on wide area information servers because honestly I don't remember anything about those like what is a wide area information server I'm not sure I don't know if I ever used one so that's on page 173 um, and we'll, we'll have a look at that once we get through the table of contents here all right so that was chapter 12 World Wide Web now we're up to chapter 13 miscellaneous internet tools ping trace route slash hop check finger host lookup x.500 who is CSO slash ph talk IRC, voice communications, video communications. Chapter 14, how to access the internet with Windows. SLIP and PPP, Windows 95, using the Internet Setup Wizard and the Microsoft Network, Trumpet Winsock, TCP IP 32 for Windows for Workgroups, alternative TCP IP solutions, what to do if things go wrong. Chapter 15, Windows Internet Software 1, email, Usenet, FTP, Telnet, Hitelnet for Windows. Chapter 16, Windows Internet Software 2, Archie, Gopher, WAIS. Chapter 17, Windows Internet Software 3. Ping, Traceroute slash Hopcheck, Finger, Host Lookup, X500, Who Is, CSO slash PH Clients, Chat, IRC, World's Chat, Sound and Vision, Miscellaneous. Chapter 18, Netscape. Netscape, Configuring Netscape, Helper Applications, Bookmarks, The Right Hand Mouse Button. Hmm. <clears throat> Chapter 19, Mosaic and Other World Wide Web Software. Mosaic, installing Mosaic, Cello or Cello, uh, WinWeb, commercial web browsers, www servers, CGI and scripts. Let's have a look at CGI and scripts. We want to see that, don't we? That's uh, 390. It would be 390. <coughs> security. <laughs> I think we'll have to follow on and read about security of uh, HTTP. <laughs> um, WHTTPD, HTTPS. In 1996, 392. We'll definitely check out those three sections, I reckon. All right, we've got chapter 20. How to create World Wide Web pages. HTML basics. HTML reference sources. HTML editors. Chapter 21. Finding things. Searching mailing lists. Searching Usenet. Searching with Archie. Searching with Gophers and Veronica. Searching with WAIS. Searching with the World Wide Web. Browsing the World Wide Web. Chapter 22. Finding people. X500, who is, CSO slash PH, net find and no bot, other search techniques. Chapter 23, lists of information, general lists, email, mailing lists, Usenet, FTP, Telnet, Archie, Gopher, WAIS, World Wide Web, online bibliographies. Chapter 24, major sites, what's new, general sites, international sites, computer sites, publishing sites, other business sites, internet shopping sites, miscellaneous sites. I think we have to have a quick look through that too, don't we? Let's say uh, 485. All right, so we've got 173, 390, and 485. <clears throat> That'll do, I think, because uh, that's a lot. Um, what's new, general, international computer publishing, other business sites, internet shopping sites, miscellaneous sites. Okay, cool. Um, chapter 25, internet culture. <laughs> Words, images, music, audio, video, real-time information, miscellaneous. Chapter 26, history and structure of the internet. Present structure, internet usage. Chapter 27, business on the internet. Promotion and selling on the internet. Payment methods, hackers and crackers, viruses and passwords. Chapter 28, the future of the internet. Future features, the information superhighway. Privacy and supranationality, artificial worlds. Appendix A, internet providers. Appendix B, modems and communications. Appendix C, pretty good privacy, obtaining PGP, signatures. Appendix D, step-by-step -step FTP. Appendix E, bits, bytes, and ASCII. Internet addresses, binary programs, ASCII, encoding. Glossary, URL, index, and index. All right, let's have a quick look at this preface. What do we got here? All right, well, this is a how to use this book. Might as well read it, I suppose. How to use this book. This book aims to provide a complete introduction to understanding and using all aspects of the internet. It assumes no previous knowledge of the subject and can be read by anyone who knows how to use a computer. It is designed to be read from the beginning to the end, though the first few chapters can be skimmed through by those who already have some familiarity with the subject, while later chapters can be left to a second reading. The basic concepts are presented several times with increasing levels of detail, rather than overloading chapters with everything at once. This is to allow readers to progress at their own pace and to absorb the information more easily. If you find things moving a little too fast at any point, reread the earlier explanation to refresh your memory. Also included in this general first section are details of how to access almost everything on the internet using the simplest means of all, electronic mail. 
email. After this introduction, step-by-step -step instructions are given on how to connect to the internet using Microsoft Windows, both Windows 95 and Windows 3.1. There follows a detailed description of many dozens of free or nearly free Windows programs covering all aspects of the internet, including where to find them, how to set them up, and how to get the most from them. Microsoft Windows is fast becoming the most important operating system for personal users of the internet. There are already more such Windows programs than for any other platform, with others arriving every week. The following parts look at how to find things and people on the internet. This section is not about specific software, but describes instead general search tools and techniques available to all internet users. Other chapters explain where to find the main sources of background and reference information about the internet and, and which are the principal sites that are worth visiting. The final section considers the internet's past, how it is currently evolving, particularly in the rapidly growing area of commerce, and what the future holds in store. There are five appendices, information about internet suppliers, with a, a list of those in the UK. Oh, I assumed it was US, but it looks like he's in the UK. I didn't, uh, I didn't notice that. Did you notice that? What have we got here? Where were we printed? British Library Cataloging. Ah, okay. Uh, printed and bound in Great Britain. Oh, there you go. Interesting. Uh, a backgrounder on modems. Sorry, I'll start that again. There are five appendices. Information about internet suppliers with a list of those in the UK. A backgrounder on modems. Information on how to set up the important, pretty good privacy security software. A step-by-step -step example of how to download files from a distant site. And a quick explanation of the binary and ASCII systems. These are followed by a comprehensive glossary and two full indexes. The first is of the internet addresses found in bold typeface throughout the, this book. For example, gopher.microsoft.com. And the second is the subjects covered. The glossary and subject index are designed to be used together. When you are looking for information about a particular topic, the glossary should be the first port of call for a quick definition, while the index will refer you to further details in the text. Internet addresses, an important note. It is worth stressing one crucial aspect of the internet addresses, addresses mentioned above. Some of these are so long that they have been split across two consecutive lines in the text of the book. For example, at the bottom of page 57, there's this long URL. However, it is important to remember that there are never any spaces in an internet address. So if you need to type them into a program at any time, always treat them as if they were written unbroken on one line with no spaces. Then he's got some acknowledgements here. Um, <sighs> He gives his old email address. Messages can be sent to me, ab07 at cityscape.co.uk. Huh, ab07 at cityscape.co.uk. Fascinating. All right, and then we're on to chapter one, the internet. The internet is a global network of computers linking together millions of machines from the mightiest mainframe to the humblest home computer. Any two computers connected to this network can exchange information as easily if they were linked together directly. For the user, this means that you can send messages, retrieve files, visit internet sites, and inspect the information they hold anywhere in the world. Moreover, because of the way in which the internet works, the cost of doing so is likely to be that of a local telephone call, whether you are talking to a computer locally in London or in Los Angeles. All right, so let's jump up to page 173 and see what that says. 173. Ah, yes, wide area information servers. I have no memory of this technology. I don't think I ever used it. Wide Area Information Servers, WAIS, offer a way of searching for information that is rather different from both Archie and Gopher. Whereas the former is based around names of files and the latter around a hierarchy of menus which attempt to impose some overall structure on various sets of the internet's information, the WAIS service lets you carry out text searches on the final documents themselves. Clearly this is potentially much more powerful than either Archie or Gopher since you are not dependent on someone else's indexing scheme. Instead you search for pre precisely the terms you want. The drawback is that there are currently far fewer WIS servers than Gophers, and the quantity of information that can be searched in this way is relatively small, though growing. For this reason, WAIS is best regarded as a complementary tool to Gophers, and to a lesser extent to Archie, rather than any kind of substitute. Okay, well that technology didn't fly, did it? Google ate their lunch. I don't know when Google comes out, maybe a year or two after this. I think they were around in 99, I don't know if they were around much earlier than that, maybe, I don't remember. <sighs> As the name, this is the introduction to this chapter, I'll keep on going. As the name suggests, WAIS is based around the standard client-server model. Like Archie or Gopher, the most natural way to use it is therefore by running a WAIS client on your PC. There are several freeware and shareware programs available and they all work similarly. See chapter 16 for details. Before you can carry out a search, you must first select the database <coughs> databases in which the WAS server software will look. It is not possible to search through all the information held in this format, or rather it would take so long as not to be useful. There are now several hundred of these, often on quite specific subjects. The figure below shows a few typical databases called sources in WAS jargon that are available. So here we are, a couple of pictures of the um, 
of the software. A sample of the WAS databases or sources that are available. Okay. Uh, included in current searches. Available for searching. All right. Midwest Weather. Mil Miljo Database. Uh, Monashani Phone Directory. Movie Lists. Music Surveys. NAFTA. Uh, NASA Lark ABS. NC Supreme Court. Net Bib. Net CDF Group. Net Info Docs. CIC Net Directory of Servers, Cool Directory of Servers, Directory of Servers, Directory Xenon Inria, France. Okay. So, yeah, there you go. Some old tech uh, that you, um, you, you basically had uh, some sort of databases that you connect to and you could do full text search and you could get back documents that were basically ASCII pages by the looks of them. Fascinating. And uh, looks like someone... Oh, okay, so uh, Netscape seemed to have supported the protocol. Fascinating. So there's a URL here, wais colon slash slash quake dot think dot com, directory of servers, global plus warming. Oh, fascinating. Okay. So you could get uh, global warming information back in the mid-90s. <clears throat> and there you go, just some more screenshots. It seemed to basically be ASCII content, didn't it? Here's the netiquette section for WAIS. WAIS is something of a Cinderella among the internet search engines and is not so popular as either Archie or Gopher. For this reason, you are unlikely to have much problem accessing WAIS servers at any time of the day. Still, as a courtesy to the sites that run them and make them freely available over the internet, you should try to limit your accesses to their off-peak hours. In particular, you should bear in mind that there are many WAIS sources stored on computers in Australia. See the listing at the... Oh, it's at w3.org. Fascinating so that accessing them will use up limited internet connections, although it may not always be obvious where the sources are held unless you refer to the web page just mentioned. <clears throat> that web page just mentioned, by the way, was um, at w3.org, which is the W3C. Hypertext, data sources, WAIS, by host.html. Fascinating. <sighs> the WAIS mail services seem to be available only at one site, so should be used sparingly. Okay, what to do if things go wrong, blah, blah, blah. All right, the next thing we we're going to check out was at page 390. Let's jump up to 390. And this is, oh, I see, yep. This was CGI scripts um, in the Mosaic and other World Wide Web software. So now we're looking at server side. Where web servers restrict, <coughs> oh, not where, were. Were web servers restrict restricted to just sending out documents written in HTML, they would be rather limited in their capabilities. For example, it would not be possible to search through web pages on the server or to place orders for goods and services. This potential problem has been solved using something known as the Common Gateway Interface, or CGI. As you move around websites, you will frequently come across subdirectories which are named things like CGI bin. Within such directories are held executable files and what are called scripts, although sometimes the term script is used for both. These are different types of programs that can be run at the instigation of someone accessing the web server with a browser. This means that <coughs> the server's functionality can be extended in any number of ways. In particular, it allows other services such as WAIS to be called to carry out tasks like searching through databases. Such scripts are frequently written in a language called Perl, practical extraction and report language. However, for Windows web servers, it is possible to write them in Visual Basic 2. For more information on CGI, see the URL http colon slash slash whoo.ncsa.uiuc.edu slash cgi slash overview.html. For more on Perl, there is plenty of information at uh, cis.ufl.edu and nexor.co.uk. While the page at nexor.co.uk details how to obtain it in versions for DOS and Windows NT. Uh, but not ordinary Windows, unfortunately. There is a busy Usenet news group called conf.infosystems.www.authoring.cgi devoted to the subject of CGI. Security. The other area where web servers have moved far beyond simply sending out HTML documents to web clients is that of security. One of the important new uses of web servers is the provision of paid for information and online sales. For transactions like credit card payments to be possible over the internet, it is necessary to use some kind of encryption that hides the details from any prying eyes, since the internet itself is still not a particularly safe system, though through encryption technique techniques its use can be made completely secure. There are a pair of proprietary standards under development, one called Secure HTTP, SHTTP and the other Secure Sockets Layer or SSL that specify how to do this. For more details on SHTTP, see commerce.net huh? and for SSL, see netscape.com. 
Uh, fortunately, an agreement between the various parties involved should lead to these slightly different approaches coming together to form a common and widely accepted security standard. Whether or not a web server needs these additional security features depends entirely on its intended use. If it will be employed simply to give out free information, they are probably not necessary, but as soon as financial transactions are involved, they almost certainly are. Okay, and then we're going to jump up to uh, page 485. And that'll do, that'll do us, I reckon. This actually got most interesting at the back, I reckon. It's a, <laughs> all right. So uh, this is what's new, major sites. Chapter 24, major sites. The previous chapter concentrated on sites and documents that offer good jumping off points for further exploration through the consolidated information they provide, often in the form of lists. This chapter looks at <clears throat> uh, sites that can be regarded as important for one reason or another, either because of the breadth or depth of their holdings, or for some point of unusual design, for historical reasons, or simply because they're interesting or unusual. They are predominantly worldwide websites, largely because it is in this area that most new activity is taking place. Uh, some of, the, uh, of those mentioned here will be useful on a daily basis. Others are worth visiting perhaps once or twice just for the experience. For other interesting locations, see Chapter 25, where a different approach and categorization is used. What's new? All right. So um, you can, you can uh, get a list of what's new at internic.net. There you go, via email. Um, there's a, a, a Usenet group um, for announcements. Interesting. Um, okay. There's GNN.com. I don't know what that stands for. <sighs> All right. Well, this is just a bunch. Oh, look, here we go. There's Yahoo. Yahoo. What's new on Yahoo? Fascinating. General sites, Internet, GNN. Tell me about GNN. The Global Network Navigator has changing features on particular topics and a directory listing that lets you search for information on specific areas. It was one of the first such sites on the internet and has remained popular. Okay, there's ei.net, there's uh, uiuc.edu. <laughs> there's a comment here about Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee, uh, oh, okay, it's, it's, uh, the birthplace of the World Wide Web at CERN used to have a very large and important internet site, info.cern.ch, but all of the information one stored there is now held at the home site of the W3 Consortium based at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This new organization is charged with promoting the development of the World Wide Web and is run by Tim Berners-Lee, who devised it in the first place. The W3 Consortium is discussed again in Chapter 26. The home site of the Netscape browser at netscape.com is not just about Netscape, it also has some excellent links to other interesting sites, search engines, and much else. Similarly, the home site of Mosaic Oh, which is, that's what's at the university. Interesting. Contains far more than simply information about its now world-famous product and is well worth exploring at length. All right. International sites. All right. Huh. Computer sites. IBM.com. Digital.com. Hewlett-Packard.com. Sun.com. Wow. Well, the world has changed. Fascinating. Time Warner's model web publishing site. Oh, there's Wacko Jacko. Making history. Michael Jackson, the mercurial king of pop, stages his comeback with the release of his first album since 1991's Dangerous. Yeah, all right. Internet shopping sites. Buying CDs. That is not using HTTPS, my friend. I wonder if... Oh, yep, there it goes. Internet shopping. Internet.net. Internet shopping network. Yeah, right. Well, Amazon ate their lunch, didn't it? Library of Congress in America. Shakespeare on the net, shakespeare.com. Ah. Uh, NASA and uh, UIUC. I'm not sure which university that is. Is it going to tell us? Yeah. Oh, it's the University of Illinois. Cool. All right. Well, I think that about does it. Do we want to have a quick look at the uh, the appendices? Appendices. Internet culture. That's probably changed a bit over the years. <clears throat> As the previous few chapters have shown, the internet contains information on just about every sphere of human activity, accessible through the various search tools, lists, and sites discussed earlier. But the internet has also generated its own unique culture, whose manifestations are sometimes extensions of pre-existing elements, but may also be quite new. This chapter looks at how the basic elements of the internet, text, images, sound, etc., are being used to create characteristic forms of expression in this new medium. Words. 
Since it is only relatively recently that the internet has, through the World Wide Web, added images to words as part of its common currency, it should come as no surprise that many of the most typical activities on the internet have to do with text. Alongside the unique world of Usenet groups, which themselves represent a quite new form of global culture with its own anthropology, there are various kinds of online publications that have sprung up. Some are just extensions of hard copy publications. Many publishers are looking at producing internet versions of their magazines and newspapers, partly out of fear that this new publishing medium may one day supplant the older forms. Good lists of online newspapers and magazines can be found at uh, ufl.edu edu, and nyc.pipeline.com. Alongside, alongside these official publishers, there are many unofficial ones who exploit the internet's easy access to produce and distribute magazines in a way that would be impossible using conventional methods. Many of these titles are, are, are what are called e-zines, electronic fanzines, produced e-zines. Uh, a list of uh, e-zines may be obtained from the following address at etext.org or by Gopher from ca.us and viewed on the web at the URL merer.net <laughs> slash, okay, it's someone's home directory, isn't that classic? The latter has hot links to the, <laughs> hot links to the relevant sites where the e-zines are held. Uh, there is also a Usenet group dealing with the subject called alt.zines. E-zines can be about anything. This one's about grilled tetrodactyl. Okay. <clears throat> so, there we go. Telling you about Project Gutenberg, which is free textbooks, uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, well, Wikipedia ate their lunch, the Quotations Collection. Oh, okay, there you go. Someone had a quote database. Uh, Doreen, I don't know who Doreen is. Images, okay, and what else have we got? Music, okay. There's MIDI. Fair enough. That was. A sort of a fleeting technology, wasn't it? In MIDI, I used to have those, and mods. Mods were sort of like MIDI. Video. Well, we've got YouTube now, and Vimeo. Real-time information. And it looks like weather sites. There you go. Find out about the weather. Miscellaneous. Shakespearean insults. Huh. Huh. Okay. Useless pages. America's funniest home hypermedia. All right, and the history and structure of the internet. Let's have a quick look at the history, huh? Chapter 26, History and Structure of the Internet. Partly because the internet has no controlling body to direct its future development, the legacy of the past remains an important factor in its current structures. This chapter looks briefly at how the internet arose and what the consequences are in terms of today's organization and ways of working. For a condensed history, send a blank message to the address timeline at hobbs.mitre.org to retrieve Robert Zarkon's internet timeline or visit the page at tig.com, ibctimeline.html. Ironically, for something which has evolved into such an anarchic libertarian environment, the internet grew out of a project that began by the US Department of Defense. During the height of the Cold War, it was decided that the communications infrastructure of the USA was all too vulnerable to a preemptive strike. The solution adopted was to decentralize so that no one point controlled the network and would therefore form a potential weak spot. Instead, all points connected together were peers of equal importance. Moreover, the network traffic could reroute itself in the event of one or more nodes or lines being damaged, an important characteristic of the underlying packet switch technology which was chosen for this reason. This network was initially called ARPANET, uh, taking its name from ARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, which later became DARPA. Although created by the US military, it soon added US university departments that were working on military projects and which needed to exchange information with bases around America. In the early 1970s, the first overseas nodes were added in the UK and Norway. Again, these were purely military connections and were designed to aid communications with friendly powers. But by now, important changes were happening within the network. As more and more universities joined, the network became an important way of communicating among themselves rather than purely as a means of linking them to the military machine. Recognizing this, the US government set up a formal backbone to the growing academic network called Computer Science Research Network, or CSNet. This was funded largely by the US National Science Foundation, the NSF, and eventually grew into what was called NSFNet the main backbone of the internet to which all other networks were connected and forming the main data pipe between other subsidiary networks which serve local needs. In the UK, the equivalent backbone was Janet, the Joint Academic Network. See ukearner.ac.uk for more details. <clears throat> During this gradual evolution of a military network into one base around, <clears throat> based around universities, there was an important development on the technical front. 
Initially, the standards controlling the flow of information had been quite simple, but as the network grew, it became necessary to extend the form and formalize them. This was done in 1974 when uh, Vincent Cerf and Robert Kahn drew up the TCP IP protocols. For full details of these, see RFC 793. These protocols describe how data is divided up into packets and then sent over the network in a reliable way. It was from the second part of the acronym, Transmission Control Protocol slash Internet Protocol, that the Internet derives its name. Strictly speaking, an Internet is any connection of networks using these rules, while the Internet is the overarching collection of such networks following the TCP IP protocols. A crucial element of TCP IP was the Internet Protocol address system employed to ensure that each packet arrived at the right place. Four 8-bit numbers, or octets, were used to specify addresses. These were usually written in the form of four decimal numbers, each under 256, and separated by a dot. An example of an address would therefore be 123.45.67.89. I wonder who has that one. That's a good IP address to have, isn't it? Anyway. <laughs> um, <clears throat> However neat and logical this was for the computers doing the routing of information, such addresses were rather unmemorable for the people who used them. An alternative form using the domain name system, DNS, was therefore developed. See RFC 1034 and RFC 1035 for the original standards. Addresses could now take the form of a series of words, again separated by dots. For example, src.doc.ic.ac.uk, pronounced source dot dot blah blah blah. blah. Um, Perhaps the most noticeable element of the DNS form is the end domain. Originally, there were six principal domains, .mil, .edu, .gov, .org, .com, .net, corresponding to the US military, universities, government bodies, non-governmental organizations, companies. The last was very, re the last was very rarely used at first. <laughs> and networks. And when other countries began to join the internet, codes were created to represent their domains. For example, .uk, .ie, .de, .fr, and .it etc. A list of the various country domain names can be found at nw.com, also merit.edu. Note that um, with typical Anglo-Saxon uh, perversity, there are actually two valid domains in use in the Br British Isles, .uk, the commoner, and .gb. Another unusual domain is .int, for ish international bodies. <coughs> Within each of these domains, there are then similar subdomains to those used in the USA, where the .us ending, which does exist and is even used occasionally, is assumed by default. So, in the UK, the .com domain is called .co, and the .edu domain .ac. <coughs> Alright, uh, what form these subdomains take is up to, oh, okay, what form these subdomains take is up to each country to decide. To the left of them can be found the name of the organization or company in question. For example, src.doc.ic.ac.uk is a site at that Department of Computing at Imperial College at a university in the UK. Note that some countries, for example Germany, use subdomains like .co and .ac very little and prefer instead to use longer names and uh, more organizational subdomains. There you go. Anyway, we won't, uh, we won't go reading about the history of URLs. I think that about does us actually. Uh, the rush for network addresses. Yeah, wow. And, uh, yeah, that's just talking about different size network blocks, and I guess there was trading of them, and there is only, uh, what, a few billion of them. Thus, IPv6, of course. All right, that's it. So, uh, I'll put you back over here to finish. So that, uh, that actually took quite a while to go through, didn't it? So that was what the, uh, what the internet was like in uh, in 1996, um, and and that's the that's the old book review for today. So up soon, uh, I'll be doing another new book review. I'll also be doing uh, a couple of the uh, electronics projects that I do, and I've got a whole box here, a ho whole box full of projects to do. Um, so um, I'll find something to work on, and we can work on that together uh, in a future video. So uh, if you want to see that, hit subscribe. Um, I'm going to try and do a video every day, but. Uh, I don't know if I'm quite ready to perform at that level yet, but uh, we'll see how we go. Um, but at least there's a video today, so I'll publish this one. And I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next. See you soon.